Hello and welcome. You join us at Maidervale Studios and this is where we have our lovely chat, our web chat, um, with Guy and with Pete from Elbow. And these are your questions that you've been sending through to us. I shall now pose them. Are you both all right? Yeah, yeah fine, thanks. Good, cheers. Uh, you had Bill Nye checking you out while you were doing your sound check earlier on. Did you see that? Did you see him? I saw him, yeah, and I, was ca I wasn't I was, I was 100% sure it was him. And I found out after that and, and that was cool. See, I knew it was him because I saw him in the corridors earlier on. But I was still really pleased. We were actually only going to do... Half the song we were rehearsing, decided to do it all the way to the end because Bill was watching. Yeah, special performance just for Bill. Yeah. He's very cool. Oh, he is very cool. Yeah, super cool. Right, okay, we're going to ask these questions. So the first one is from Dave, and he sent an email. It said, quite simply, how did you get the name Elbow for the band? You can answer this one. We got the name Elbow by laziness, really. Um, it was, I don't know how many years ago, years and years and years ago, and we, we we had to come up with a name, and none of us could be bothered except for Guy, who came up with Elbow. Yeah, I but how and why? Well, I came up with loads of names, and we all got together, and I was really excited. We're going to have a new name. <coughs> Sorry, what was the name at that point? Soft. Soft, that's right. Previously, we were Mr. Soft, <laughs> and the music had changed. So I wrote loads of ideas down. The lads didn't give it another thought. I got stroppy and just put my finger in the middle of the page. And Elbow was on there because of uh, The Singing Detective by Dennis Potter. There was a, a line of dialogue in that, which rather than tell Dave, was it? Dave, it was Dave, yeah. Rather than tell Dave the exact reasoning, I think we should encourage him to watch all of The Singing Detective because it's great. And then you'll find out. Uh, next question is from Marcus. Um, I saw an interview with Guy recently in which he said the template for the album, The Takeoff and Landing of Everything, was going to be about a farmer's son stealing a pig. Is that the weirdest thing guys suggested when it comes to songs or albums? I guess, Pete, this is your question then. <coughs> that, uh, the, yeah, I, I still to this day can't figure out why you, you came in the room and, <laughs> and put that forward. It was, it was going to uh, come across badly. It, it's on the Leaders of the Free World DVD. Yeah. All the lads are sat in the studio late at night and I come in and suggest that. And uh, I don't remember suggesting it, which might suggest <laughs> why I suggested it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pat, do the other members of the band feel that Guy's longish stay in New York has influenced his writing? And what impact has the stay had on the band? That's you again? Yeah, it's all over to you. Um, you could leave if you like now, frankly, Guy. Yeah. <laughs> we, don't, yeah. we don't need you here. Um, yeah, what, I, I, you know, when he disappeared, how long was I, it for? Well, I think it's good. I mean, because Guy's, you know, writes lyrics. I think it's good for him to sort of, uh, you know, get away and, and sort of like, to get away you know, from it's to get away from it and just, to, you know, experience something new, a different place. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a good thing, and we we can work really well, you know, like that. We we we're kind of like at home in Salford working on music, and guys kind of like you know working on lyrics. We can we can do it. Tell us about your time in New York. How long was it for? Uh, over the period of uh, about uh, eighteen months, I was over there loads in long and short blocks. The longest I was there for in a row was probably about five weeks, but it totaled about I don't know three or four months, something like that, and. Uh, yeah, initially it was just exploring, and then I got really familiar with the place. And then the last two visits were kind of um, almost deliberately to collect myself and finish the record. So it was inspiring right at the front, and then we did loads of different things. Did loads of work in uh, Peter Gabriel's place, and, and mostly in Salford, where, where we uh, were at Blueprint Studio. And then right at the end, I went back there to finish it all off. And what kind of an effect did it have on you? Why did you fall under the spell of New York, and what did it... Yeah, what effect it haven't you? Well, the immediate thing with New York, the first time I was there was 28 years ago when I was over with a band. And I, I know, isn't it? No, hang on, is that right? No, that no. I can't have been 18 12. years no. ago. Like about 14, maybe? Yeah, 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 okay. Maths is me, thing. So yeah. are you okay with words? You're fine. <coughs> yeah, cheers. Uh, yeah, I fell in love with the place. I'll tell you why I thought 28. I was 28. It was my 28th birthday. Yeah, so 12 years ago. And... Um, Everybody's wowed by how big it is, how complex the design is, how, you know, their post offices are, uh, are bigger than our cathedrals and as beautiful. And uh, you're struck by all that. And then the more time you spend there, the more you get into how it must feel to live and work there or to be born there. And you end up realising it's quite a fragile place, which is held together by um, a, a strong sense of community. And also, there's the, I like the fact that the whole city is immigrants. And at a time when, you know, it's, it's the centre of Western capitalism, and yet the whole thing was made by and, and is run by now and held together by 
immigrants. So I really like that about him. And, and being anonymous there and just kind of slipping in under the radar, did, how did that feel? It felt great. I mean, it, it's not like I was running away from my public. It was nothing like that. Mm. It's like we all really, we're all really proud of what we've done and it's great to be recognised in the street in the UK and to have people say nice things. But it is also nice to be able to go and people watch anonymously somewhere. Did you talk to a lot of strangers? Did you yeah. make good yeah. friends? Yeah, I did. And and I sort of, I mean, I made them on my own merits, you know, because I, I think if people know that you're in a band or you're in any way in the public eye, I don't know if you've experienced this, you tend to get the best side of people. And sometimes you're quite shocked when somebody said, God, he was horrible. And, you, and you're like, I thought he was really nice. Mm. You know, so out there you meet people and if they are really nice to you, you know, it's on your merits and, and not on the back of anything you've done. So it's it's I'm really spoilt to be able to do both things. Mm. Tell us about the lesson that you got from Yoko Ono. Well, just extraordinary that um, the song New York Morning, which was written on one of my first visits over the last couple of years, it's just an excited diary entry about the skyline. The music's supposed to represent the different skylines as it builds, and and it was just all my initial thoughts being there of a beautiful morning. And I put a line in, uh, it's the modern Roman folk and nice to Yoko, which was inspired by watching um, Chris Eccleston in John Lennon Naked. And it, it shows the last press conference that John Lennon and Yoko Ono held in Britain and where, where Lennon tells them that they're going to New York because they basically felt chased out by the British media. Um, really awful racist headlines sort of chasing them both out of the country. And New York really gathered them up and loved them and... You know, they had a great time there and they're still celebrated there. New York adopted them, really. Um, and uh, we got the most amazing letter from her, sort of confirming my suspicions about how it must have felt and thanking us for the, the song and talking about how, yeah, it was awful that you've been chased out of the UK and, and how they really did have a, a wonderful time in New York, despite, of course, what eventually happened there. So a really lovely letter and a photograph of her and John in... Central Park. And oh my gosh, to be cherished. Oh, yeah. And just, just uh, yeah. And I, and I got a happy birthday off for a couple of weeks later. Yeah, which is just. In, in what way did she send a text? Or tweet. A, a tweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I take that. Very sweet. Yeah. So you've not met her yet? No. I actually, I met her once years ago on a stairwell. <laughs> and I just went, hey, Yoko. And she went, hello. <laughs> and it's like that. I bet you're about three times the size of her. Yeah, 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 pretty much. Uh, right, this moving on. Juliet says, from the very first listen, I've been completely obsessed with my sad captains. So I would love to know a bit about how the song came about. It's it's a very touching and emotional song. When you do hear it, it does stand out on the album, I think. Music first, wasn't it? <coughs> yeah, it was music first. Um, I, it's, I think it's a quite a funny one. It was the groove on it. Yeah, um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not percent sure. <laughs> but I think that's th the thing that strikes you with the lyrics from that song. Okay. I think that's why it touches people because it's. Um, but tell us what it's about. D check whether I've got it right. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I started. I wanted to write um, kind of a, a celebration of my old friends that I don't see enough of anymore. Um, one or two because they died. Um, Anybody hitting 40, that's probably happened. <clears throat> um, but more of them because they've got different lifestyles to me. And perhaps, you know, I found myself a couple of times in the pub thinking, we used to run around this place till seven in the morning, four nights a week. And, you know, and, you know, and also my, my, my tastes have changed in that I prefer the company of one or two people these days and, uh, and getting into it. But it used to be a big bunch of us for many years, wasn't it? 15 years or something. So it's a sort of a little bit of a, an anthem about those times. Uh, it feels like a lament and then also a celebration of those is, friendships. It is, yeah. And it, was, it, was, it was a difficult song to write lyrically because it is, there's something really light and jangly about the guitar and then you've got this big stomping groove which is quite slow and cumbersome and there's something mechanical about that. So it wanted to be uplifting but it also wanted to be like forlorn a little bit. And as for the lyrics, um, I got the first lines uh, um, and realised what I wanted to write about and then Emma Jane Unsworth my ex-girlfriend who's the, quite the Shakespeare scholar she pointed she out she writes doesn't she, she's, she she's quite good with words as well she's amazing yeah she's got a, a great book coming out actually this year um, called Animals and we've got quite a few lines both on the album and in the book that neither of us can remember who wrote them 
<laughs> sort of, sort of joint blurred custody. Lines. Yeah, blurred lines, joint, joint custody of. Uh, in any case, so she's always very inspiring. And she said, uh, Anthony and Cleopatra's a middle-aged love story. Shakespeare's only middle-aged love story. Uh, and they've both given up an awful lot to be together. And he mourns his sad captains and he wants to uh, once more mock the midnight bell, is the way he puts it. So I borrowed that. And then also Pete Jobson, who, who now plays with Nadine Shah and who, who, who's uh, played with I Am Clute for years, he, he's fond of saying, whenever you consider going home early, uh, he's fond of saying, we passed this way but once, which is like, come on, you've got one life, live it to the full. Uh, so Shakespeare and Pete Jobson. And there you go, there's a chorus. Yeah, there are your two yeah. marks. Um, and what, oh, this is from Chris, what is your favourite song to play live on the takeoff and landing of everything? Because we're going to see, you know, some of the classics tonight, but we're also going to see stuff from the new album. So which, one, which one do you love yeah. playing? It change, well, listening to the album, it changes. My favourites change. But playing live, I like playing Flyboy Blue. Uh, we've got like an amazing brass section mm. and it just, it, it's just bizarre, but it, it, it's cool. I'd imagine it soars for you. That, it's probably that one. I, I get a little bit of a rest when the brass come in. So you're just lazy, really. That's all. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You get a, break, get a bit of yeah. a break. So reach for the pint. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's lovely to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Congratulations on a, another great album. Thanks, Joe. Thank you.